My name is Mark Gomez, and I'm with the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society at UC Berkeley. And Haas is a hub for researchers and community partners who are thinking about identifying and overcoming the barriers to a more inclusive society. And my project is the Leaping Bear, the Leap Forward project. And we facilitate research and development on tackling extreme inequality, ending racial economic exclusion, and promoting enduring prosperity. And so to briefly introduce Christina, this is Associate Professor G. Christina Mora of Sociology from the University of California, Berkeley. So Mark asked me to come and talk about my book, which is uh, historical. But I think uh, after, and it's much more comprehensive than a 20 minute presentation, but I think afterwards what I'm really looking forward to is our Q&A and maybe thinking about how some of these issues might still be present today or how some of these issues might sort of change the way we think about uh, the racial political landscape in the United States, okay? Um, so today I'll be speaking about the book, which was which is titled Making Hispanics, and it was published by the University of Chicago Press. And it's about the development of what we think of as the Hispanic or Latino category in the United States. And the category is controversial on many levels. Uh, we often hear people say, well, I'm not Hispanic, I'm Mexican, or I'm Chicano, or I'm Cuban. Uh, that label doesn't apply to me, I don't identify with that. Or it's controversial because the wording is controversial. I don't call myself Hispanic. I call myself Latino, or more recently, I call myself Latinx, right? Um, that's less about a resistance to being grouped with other people and more resistance around labels and definitions. Um, but still, despite the controversies, the pan-ethnic, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx category is still around. And I argue it's one of the most consequential developments in Latino political history. And my book is the first to really document and show how this category ever even emerged in the first place, despite all the objections and despite the controversies. And so to begin, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you back to the late 1960s. If we could peek into the field of social movements in America, we'd find images like this. Activists in the Southwest shouted Chicano power and led protests to draw attention to poverty and education issues. In the Northeast, Puerto Ricans used protests to highlight issues of Puerto Rican sovereignty and urban development in places like New York and Philadelphia. And in Miami, political groups were focused on denouncing Castro and the developments of the Cuban Revolution. So what developed was, for the most part, a pattern of really distinct, disparate political communities. Mexicans organized Mexicans in the Southwest, Puerto Ricans organized co-ethnics in the Northeast, and Cubans did the same in Miami. But we might think that perhaps in other sectors, perhaps not politics, but maybe media or maybe the market, we find much more connectivity, much more sort of merging of people together. But if we look at commercial television in the late 1960s, we find the same patterns. TV guide listings show that Spanish language stations in the Southwest broadcasted several hours of Mexican programming. Puerto Rican entrepreneurs in New York imported soap operas, comedies, and other shows made in San Juan. And since uh, programming couldn't be purchased from Cuba at the time, entrepreneurs in Miami rented studios and they made their own shows for Cuban American audiences. And what you had was really three different, really distinct Spanish language stations. That was the late 1960s. But by 1990, America looks much different. First, Several of these Mexican-American organizations evolved by attracting Puerto Rican and Cuban constituents and lobbying on behalf of what they now call Hispanic civil rights. By 1990, Univision, the nation's large, it becomes the nation's largest Spanish language television network. It consolidates programming agenda and it now delivers the same programming to Mexican, Cuban, and Puerto Rican audiences across the country. Last, but equally important, by 1990, there's this totally new census category. It's called Hispanic slash Latino slash uh, Spanish origin. And it now consolidates all of these communities into one statistical meta group. So the book asks, how did this shift occur? How did we get from disparate communities in the late 60s to suddenly this whole new category in the 1990s? Well, 
Journalists have often argued that this change happened in sort of a shift in self-identification. They contend that as migration from Latin America increased and became more diverse, that Latinos somehow began forming a pan-ethnic outlook and just saw themselves as part of the same community. But the available data that exists on pan-ethnic self-identification surveys that ask people, do you feel Hispanic? show that Hispanic identity increased over time, but only after the emergence of Hispanic social movements, Hispanic uh, television networks, and the census category. And so what my work does is it takes up this historical puzzle by examining change in organizations. And I focused on, well, how did social movements, how did agencies in the federal government, and how did the media even begin to talk about Latinos as Hispanics? And I first thought my initial foray into the research was that I would simply document separate changes in American institutions. But as I dove into the data, I dove into the archives, I realized that these entities, the federal government, the media, social movements, did not shift independently, but rather in deep relationship to one another. That is, the Census Bureau adopted a Hispanic category as activist groups adopted pan-ethnic agendas and as media firms began experimenting with different ways of producing pan-ethnic programming. And so I began tracing these changes as they emerged in relationship to one another. So the project is historical and it draws on several data sources. And what my work generally argues is that Hispanic penitentiary emerged from a pattern of what I call these cross-field effects, wherein developments in one sector, in the government or in the media or in the activist groups, sparked and accelerated these, change, these identity changes in other sectors. And at the broadest level, the argument looks like this. So first, Mexican-American and Puerto Rican activists did protest at the Census Bureau demanding better data in the late 60s. At the time, activists were motivated by the black civil rights movement, undoubtedly, and they wanted to pressure the government to provide them with resources, but first they needed data about unemployment, about poverty, and other factors to prove their claims. See, back then, the Bureau mainly categorized Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and others as whites, thus lumping their data together with the descendants of Italian and Irish immigrants and several others. So Latinos on their birth certificates, on census forms, on driver's license, and a variety of other ways were categorized as simply white. But this, of course, didn't match much of their lived reality, in which Latinos were discriminated again and treated as second-class citizens. If we think of those that lived in Texas or the Jim Crow South, uh, where restaurants and public pools denied them services as part of a larger people of color category, or if we think of the school systems where Latinos were consistently segregated into inferior and separate schools. And so when census reports at those times would come out about poverty, for example, they were usually just about black and white differences. Latino data was mixed in and folded in with whites. And so all of these reports, all of the data that existed for them were useless for activist causes. So the Bureau initially resisted activists claiming that a separate racial category for Mexicans and then another category for Puerto Ricans would be too difficult and wouldn't be statistically reliable because they'd be really small in many ways. Nonetheless, activists persisted. They appealed to friends and colleagues in the Johnson and Nixon administration and then to allies in Congress. In effect, they argued that by not separating Latinos from white, that the Bureau was First and foremost, limiting a Latino fight for equality. And second, they argue that the Bureau was unjustly trying to fit Latinos into a schema that didn't represent it. They argued that the existing white, black, Asian, and Native American categories didn't fit them, that Latinos were separate, often mixed people with different identities. After much pushback, the Bureau assisted assessed the issue. But instead of saying, okay, we'll create a separate Mexican or Puerto Rican category, they instead created this umbrella Hispanic category that would cover all the Latin groups together. Yet there was still this sticky, very sticky issue about race. The Bureau had a difficult time with this because of two main issues. First was the inconclusiveness of research. In the mid-1970s, the Bureau sat down to assess this issue of whether this new Hispanic category would be a racial one, and they sent out anthropologists 
A group of them went out to the Southwest, and another group went out to Miami. And what did they find? In an interview with a, with a former census official, she noted, well, one study deemed the Spanish origin a separate race, especially if you considered Mexican-Americans. They largely thought of themselves as different from whites. But other studies found them to be white, especially if you considered Cubans in Florida, who largely at the time saw themselves as white. The second issue of concern, concern pushback from other groups. See, when the Bureau included a Hispanic category in the race question during pre census trial and thus forced individuals to think of themselves as either Hispanic or Black or Hispanic or Asians, the number of other groups dropped. So, in an interview with a former census official, he recalled the critical meeting where the Bureau discussed the issue of race. The official said, the census director at the time spoke of the danger of including the Hispanic category as a separate race one. He knew he'd get complaints from blacks if their numbers went down overall. And you had to think about the Puerto Ricans. This is a real possibility. Not to mention the Native American numbers in the Southwest. And there was even the fear that the Filipinos in California would choose Hispanic over Asian and we'd get it from all three groups. And so one of the things I want to point out here is that what's interesting is the issue of whether Latinos would be a separate race or whether they were distinct from whites was never really systematically about how people were living their lives, but much more about these broader racial politics and trends going on. In the end, activists never pushed the race or ethnicity question much further. And so separate Hispanic category that was different from race <clears throat> emerged in the mid-70s on a variety of smaller Census Bureau reports. And this data served as an important resource, not only for social movements, but for media personnel alike. Uh, the Hispanic data helped media because they could now use this new data to show corporations and potential advertisers that, quote unquote, whoever these Hispanics were, they numbered in the millions. So in a third step, activists, census officials, and media executives worked together to really popularize the idea of a Hispanic community. That it's not just a category, these are people. And so just to show you how important the census was, for media executives, as soon as the data came out, they created marketing reports about something called a national Hispanic market. So this was one of the first manuals published in the US. It, was, it came out soon after the release of the 1980 census data. These manuals and this data helped to spur a new field of Latino media marketers who would produce reports with statements like this. They would say things like, the Census Bureau shows that Hispanics are a growing population. They have larger families than other groups and their median age is younger. And since they know, we know that they're family oriented, at the very least, the numbers mean that they will purchase more diapers and more household products than other groups. And so, of course, executives jumped at the chance to help the Census Bureau popularize this new category. They created an entire media strategy around the 1980 census with commercials, talk show segments, and even documentaries that would show basically the 1980 census form. And there'd be a big circle around the new Hispanic question. And they would say, if you think you're Mexican, if you think you're Puerto Rican, you're also Hispanic, check here. And as mentioned, social movement groups also helped the Bureau publicize the category. They passed out flyers in town halls across the country, and they, they would show them the new census forms, and they would say, hey, for a 1980 census, we need to be united. We're Hispanic on this census form. And so the book makes an elaborate argument about this notion of cross-field effects for explaining how the Hispanic category became crystallized despite the fact that many didn't recognize the category or couldn't see many connections amongst each other. And it argues that this new category was undergirded by three main factors. So first was the emergence of census resource. Indeed, census data served as a resource in the social movement field. If you think of it, activists could now use this census data, for example, on Hispanic income and write a report on poverty in Latino neighborhoods. Or they could write a report on income inequality that now used Latinos as a separate category. Second, the category was crystallized through the rise of networks because media, government officials, and activists began to get to know one another and work together to further popularize the, the category. So for example, activists eventually came on to serve as consultants to the Census Bureau and devise strategies to help them to get Latinos to fill out census forms. 
And over time, activists were actually hired as political commentators to start new Univision panethnic Hispanic programming. The third sort of factor that was really important was uh, these discursive strategies, and especially the use of ambiguity. Ambiguity was important because organizations originally developed frames that suited their needs. So when I think about this, I think about how were people talking about who this new group was, right? In their grant applications, activists depicted Hispanics. When they imagined who Hispanics were, they imagined them as a national minority that were disadvantaged, suffered from inequality, and were underrepresented. They lacked resources and opportunities. However, the Census Bureau, when it talked about Hispanics, they talked about it as a group that had these uh, quantifiable correlated <laughs> attributes, as a real statistical group that you could then plug into uh, different equations. But marketers and media talked about Hispanics in almost an entirely different ways. They talked about them as a consumer group with identifiable consumption patterns and different cultural behaviors that made them so distinct from other groups. But over time, as all these dis disparate groups of people began to work together, they also began to share one another's languages and use each other's frames. So as activists use media executives as consultants, they began to also speak about Hispanics as consumers and as people with different sets of values. So for example, this is uh, from the archives. It's a copy of a solicitation letter that an activist group used, and it says, Everybody's talking about it. The Hispanic market, enough talk, stand up and participate, contribute to us. A contribution to us is an effective way of reaching Hispanics and building goodwill for your product or service. And so there what you have is an activist group that generally engages in trying to fight for equality using the language of, yes, Hispanics are also a different consumer market. And media organizations use Hispanics as a disadvantaged minority frame to convince the FCC to provide them with special market exemptions. So this is an example uh, from a set of FCC hearings about minority ownership. And you'll see that uh, they, uh, the head of Univision says, Spanish language audiences are one of the most underserved and isolated groups in America. Their communities lack resources, including serious news and information. We serve the public interest by providing for the needs of this population. Okay, so there's different ways of speaking who this group, uh, what this group is about. But we must think that managing these different frames and representations is difficult. If we think of, of activists, on the one hand, they argue to state agencies that Hispanics are poor and disadvantaged. On the other hand, they also use this language that uh, corporations use, that Hispanics are a young, untapped, lucrative market that's up and coming. And the only way that it's possible, I argue, to reconcile all of these different images of who this group is, is by appealing to a broader, more ambiguous understanding of panethnicity. One sort of much more vague, broader argument that can link the competing frames together by emphasizing culture. So over time, as organizations interact and work together, they develop a narrative about Hispanic culture. They argue that Hispanics are religious, that they're all hardworking, that they have family values. Vague concepts that really can be applied to most any group in America. So for example, like other organizations, in fact, the Census Bureau never provided an exact definition of who exactly is Hispanic. Instead, they describe what made Hispanics Hispanics in abstract terms. So this is an excerpt from a 1985 census report. It states, Hispanics can trace their roots in the Americas back five centuries. They share a common heritage, common values, and in a common mother tongue. These and other ties unite them from east to west, north to south. So we see that panethnicity and what binds these people together is really vaguely defined. But as the organizations continue to work together, what emerges is a sort of new pl plausibility structure. <clears throat> where organizations develop an interest in maintaining the notion of panethnicity across social arenas. So activists and the Census Bureau together come together to petition vital statistics offices across the country to eventually make sure and create a Hispanic category on birth certificates. And this doesn't happen, not all 50 states have a Hispanic category until about 1992. Social movement groups then start speaking about Hispanics as consumers, and this sort of becomes a popular norm amongst many other activist groups.
Additionally, the language of Hispanics as a minority becomes available to other media firms. But these otherwise contradictory representations, these different ways of talking about who Hispanics are, can hang together because the idea of Hispanic pen ethnicity over time becomes much more vague, abstract, and taken for granted. And by 1990, what emerges is a collection of diverse organizations from state agencies to a variety of activist groups to media firms that all become invested in maintaining Hispanic pen ethnicity largely because they're interested for luck. They claim Hispanics are a minority, they are a consumer, they are, they are statistical groups because above all, what unites them above all is some kind of shared ambiguous common culture. And so I think what is at the core and strength of the category is its broadness. Because the category has never been completely defined, it can be expansive and cover as many people. Hispanics can be of any color, speak any language, hence someone with an Argentine grandma is Hispanic if they want to be, just as someone who just crossed the border from Central America. But this ambiguity is also its weakness. Uh, it makes it weak and not really able to look unified. Hence, when a category is too broad, it can lose its ability to really focus and work on and carry through an agenda. These internal contradictions notwithstanding, are important. it's important to note that the development of the Hispanic category was both an important fight for recognition in American political history, and it was consequential for relabeling America's largest minority. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go straight to you guys and gals. Folks have questions. So it was definitely not going to be Chicano. And one of the reasons it was not going to be Chicano is that that was associated much more with the Mexican-American group and Mexican identity. And even though uh, Mexicans were at that point and continue to be the largest subgroup in the, in the Penethic category, there was always, I mean, if you ever looked at these early conventions of activists coming together, Puerto Ricans were almost always consistently uh, worried that Mexican Americans would take over the agenda. Um, they said, if we get together, it's just going to be Mexican. You know, we need to be able to stand out. So it was not going to be Chicano. The Census Bureau wanted, really, really, really wanted it to be, and it, may, it stayed that way for a couple of decades. They really wanted it to be something that they called Spanish origin. Uh, but there was a lot of pushback from that, um, technical pushback and just sort of, you know, this is at a time of an emerging Chicano movement in California in which there was a really sort of reclaiming of an indigenous identity and pushing back against sort of something that was overtly Spanish. But in many ways, uh, arguments about labels become, um, you know, are reflective of the people that sit at the decision-making table. And so there were, there were at the time people in the Nixon and Johnson administration that really liked the term Hispanic. They saw themselves Hispanic. Hispano was a term uh, in New Mexico that uh, many families used to differentiate themselves from Anglos um, and some argue from uh, the indigenous <laughs> population there as well. Um, and so they argued that Hispanic would be the most recognized, most encompassing term. They argued this, there were no ever real studies <laughs> that showed that this label was the best. There were strong arguments for not having other labels. Like for example, the label Latin American was considered. But this was at a moment of American racial political history in which Latinos, you know, had just had, you know, if you look at the history of, uh, you know, the Southwest in the 1930s, there were a lot of repatriation campaigns in which sort of even Mexican-American citizens were taken back to Mexico. And so there was a real fear of any label that would make them sound too foreign. And Latin American, just like Latino for many, were considered to sound too foreign. So all that to say, no label was ever perfect. No one ever sort of fell on this label that was just, this is it. And I think today, still no label is perfect, which is why you have organizations that will call themselves Hispanic slash Latino, and now we have arguments about whether it's Latinx or not. Um, but I think it all just speaks to the inherent real contradiction and you know inherent politics of category labels. So because it's a separate question, we generally think that who we think are Hispanics are, are 
are te are using that question because it's separate because it's not uh, as of right now it's still not in a combined race and ethnicity question. This census around 2020 will tell. I mean, it all all signs point to the fact that it's now going to be a combined race and ethnicity question, and so. Uh, the Hispanic will be seen or perceived, uh, not technically, but will be perceived as mutually exclusive. So you'll be able to say, are you black or Hispanic or white, things like that. Because it was a separate question for a long time, we generally think that, you know, the vast majority of people were answering the question. Um, and because there was a real, when it came out in 1980, there was a real publicity campaign around it. I mean, there was a whole telethon where Univision took over their airways for two days and brought um, stars. And the way they did it is like, how, how do you appeal to the most diverse group and convince them like this new label? Some of, some people had never really ever heard of this before, right? Um, some people, to the extent they saw themselves as broader, thought, OK, well, maybe I'm a Spanish speaker or something, but maybe not, right? And the way they did it was they brought out uh, television stars and uh, musicians from Colombia, from uh, Cuba, from Central America, from these different places. And they all sort of made appeals to their own group and said, trust us, you know, this is what we are. This is important for us. Uh, what we do know about self-identification trends is that uh, so a category has to be made and established before it's really studied. So we actually don't have the first survey that asked people, do you feel Hispanic? Do you even like this term? Until 1990. That's well over like 15 years, you know, since these intense uh, negotiations were, were taking place. But in 1990, you had about 25% of people of Latinos say, yeah, I see myself as Hispanic, right? But by 2012, it's really close to 90%. So that really that shows to me really the power of organizations that it's not just the media driving this and it's not just political interest and it's not just a narrative of the state is ramming this down my throat it's really this combined diffuse effort in which you're getting these messages from all over History, you know, world history is about migration flows and movements as, and borders are relatively new in all of history with that, right? And so with migration flows and movements comes these arguments of who are we giving the resource to and who are you and arguments about who belongs and who doesn't and ways of trying to understand them. And when I think of what states do, I think one of the first thing a state tries to do is categorize its people. That's the way it knows what it's doing. It categorizes and sort of reaffirms a hierarchy, right? Because categories are not neutral. Um, so I think it is happening, and I think it happens on all kinds of levels. So, you know, on a more abstract level, I work in the realm of pan-ethnicity, just how, how, do, how does a category form out of smaller categories? Um, but you have that working both in the United States with categories of people in the United States, but if we think of Indian, like the national category of Indian, like I'm from India, that's a pan-ethnic category for sure. It's people of all kinds of linguistic cultures and cultural backgrounds. And so I think that process is almost fundamental that most of our national categories are pan-ethnic categories. Um, and that often we have pan-ethnic categories that traverse national boundaries. And so there's a lot of tension and fighting around that. So if we think of Mayan, for example, Mayan sort of people sort of traverse the boundaries of you know, Guatemala and uh, Mexico and things of the sort. And so, you know, fights for recognition of us as a community, despite whatever national boundary is there, is certainly present. So, yeah, the other fun fact is um, when categories, I think, are developed and crystallized and made real, either because a state, you know, agency like the Bureau, like, sees it and solidifies it and justifies it, um, it becomes its absolute own reality. Um, so soon after the Census Bureau creates this Latino category, there's all kinds of pushback. People still don't know what it is. To this day, people will still tell you, I'm Mexican, not Hispanic. As Latinos come to see themselves as Latinos and they migrate back to Latin America, for example, or 
you know, go home to visit, the Latino category becomes much more popular over there. So my favorite tidbit is over time, Univision created this whole slew of Catholic programming. It was unique. It did not exist anywhere in Latin America. This was a type of programming that was specifically tailored to attract Hispanics as Hispanics. So an example of this would be, um, there was a talk show that was the equivalent of, it was called the Spanish language uh, uh, Oprah, okay? Her name was Cristina, she had a long standing talk show, right? And it was a strategic, her strategy was, like let's say the let's say the topic was how to talk about let's just say the topic was how to talk about drugs to my kids she would strategically have a mexican family a colombian family a cuban family and it was all these sort of strategic ways of how do you create this image this show became the number one show in peru you know in lima it becomes the number one show in mexico city it is then sort of thrown back out to the world and it reshapes the way people start thinking and so I think these identity categories are continuously changing in large part because, you know, human movement changes, right? And as much as we try to create these borders and arguments, um, you know, that doesn't withstand to the way people are constantly being categorized and uh, uh, slotted into hierarchies. I'm going to start with saying this. When I think about racial politics, I hate projection. I yeah. hate projection because um, it's really political. The way we think about, you know, whether trends are going to endure or not are based yeah. on what, you know, arguments of who we think deserves what or what not, right? Um, and projections are really important and they create backlash. I mean, there's a whole sort of new literature right now on how sort of the rise of Latinos uh, in the United States and the increase, although, you know, immigration's at net zero since 2007, but that the, the perceived sense that Latinos are taking over has created a backlash, right, in America, and that sort of, uh, you know, that, I, I think part of that is projection. You know, when people say, we're going to be a majority minority by 2050 or 2025, that creates a backlash. That projection is a political statement, I think, that we're saying. Um, with that said, um, I also think that identities are and the categories in many ways are sensitive to political development. So it's not inconsequential that Trump calls, uh, uh, you know, uh, Latino immigrants, especially those from Mexico, as criminals and rapists and bad hombres. I think that in many ways that sort of reaffirms for many people the fact that they're seen as second-class citizens, so that might have an effect at sort of booing the sense of we're all in this together, you know, we need to fight for a much more um, inclusive discourse in the country. Um, but I would not have protected Trump when he... <laughs> I would not have protected that in the first place. At the same time, it is, you know, uh, la the Latino population is fueled by migration, is fueled, even though it's at net zero, that means as many people are leaving as are coming. People that are still coming come with a whole different set of needs, right? They come with sort of uh, you know, a different language that they're speaking and they're generally inserted into the economy in a way that they're making much less and they're suffering much more than other people. And that sort of base and continuous characterization of who comprises the Latino population, you can't get away from that. And as long as sort of global inequality continues, as long as sort of, you know, uh, there are not all kinds of amazing new economic opportunities that emerge in Latin America, you know, people will still continue to come. Uh, and that sort of means that Latinos will still be characterized by this inflow of people that are discriminated against, that uh, you know face all kinds of disadvantages, and that will need to be contended. At the same time, we do know that uh, you know there is certainly social mobility within the Latino population. So you do definitely have you know, Cubans that came in the 1960s and now they did very well for themselves and they've always seen themselves as white and they think of themselves as white and that's a real sort of, and you know, they have many more resources to establish themselves as speakers on behalf of Latinos or insert themselves in racial politics. And so, you know, when, you, when I think about, you know, Latinos and racial political discourse around them, 
it becomes this sort of tug of war between sort of the disadvantaged narrative that covers real sort of the sense of disadvantage and sort of speaks to how Latinos are incarcerated at extremely high rates, how they have high levels of, po of poverty, but also this sort of discourse that wants to be there about, but we're also up and coming, but we're also homeowners, but we're also doing this. So, you know, uh, there's a fantastic uh, anthropologist, her name's Arlene Davila, that has this wonderful book called Latino Spin, and it's all about how these sort of narratives of who Latinos are just really highly politicized in this way. Uh, <laughs> um, so I laugh a little bit. So yeah, um, where do I start with this? I will start by saying I generally incredibly dislike the the comparison between Italians and uh, it's generally made like you know are Mexicans just like Italians? Is in this just like fifty years later? Um, when, when groups come in and the conditions under which they come in and the way they're slotted into the American economic and political landscape really matters. Um, and Italians and Irish came in at a time in which sort of, I have a colleague that has a phenomenal book uh, called Three Worlds of Relief, her name is about Fox, you should check this out. Uh, and it really looks at um, the American social welfare landscape and who was given benefits and who was given opportunities to succeed in many ways. Um, and if you look at history, you really see that uh, the incorporation of Italians and Irish immigrants was really incredibly different from uh, the incorporation of Mexicans. I mean, Italians were never rounded up and deported. Uh, Irish weren't either. They might have been certainly denigrated on the street. There might have been uh, ethnic slurs uh, shouted against them. Uh, but uh, they were never systematically rounded up in many ways. They were never victims of uh, sort of land seizures that were taken away, things like that. So I think when we make these comparisons, uh, we should be incredibly mindful of the different contexts in which sort of groups come in. Um, there's also a fantastic book called Generations of Exclusion uh, by Ed Chase and Vilma Ortiz that looks at, um, really tackles this question because it's actually really prominent in American politics. Like, can't all just immigrants be like the Irish and Italians? Like, what's going on there, right? Um, and, you know, they use a really fascinating data set and when they follow, they can see sort of how Mexican Americans have fared you know, across generations, and really show that there are real effects of uh, discrimination, there are real effects of uh, uh, underrepresentation that sort of play in in ways that they didn't play in perhaps with other groups. And so, so one, I'd be mindful of that. I do want to say that, you know, I don't want to also downplay the realities of race, right? Colorism is incredibly important to contend with and think about. Um, uh, the darker you are, you know, and there, there are a lot more studies being done about this, uh, more so in Latin America, in Latin America than I've seen in the United States. Um, but, you know, this is one of the most complex parts about the pet ethnic category, right? It holds people with different skin tones too, you know? You know, one of uh, the things that Univision really tried to do when it thought about like, well, how are we gonna create a one news program that can really speak to Puerto Ricans and Cubans and Mexicans alike. And one of the things they really tried hard is, what does the Latino look like? And they settled on this sort of abstract sense of like, you know, olive colored skin and almond shaped eyes, as if they all looked like this, <laughs> right? Uh, but these are the politics, it, you know, right down to what is, what is the tone that they're going to use? How can they de-accentize their Spanish in order to get at everybody? And so, um, you know, I th just think it speaks to how amazingly complex the category still is, and yet with the complexity, it holds. It holds and it's been durable, uh, at least for a while. Yeah. This sort of was a, was a negotiation. And so what was lost often with sort of this push of saying, okay, we're Hispanic, uh, was a loss of a much more um, organized identity that was based on the fact of like, we've been colonized, 
we're a group of sort of people that lost their land. So if you think of Puerto Ricans, if you think of Mexican Americans that could have really mobilized on themselves, you know, that we're definitely, we're definitely not white, we're definitely distinct, right? And so there were other possibilities that could have sort of been open, like other sort of ways of thinking about racial difference that were open, but that were foreclosed in many ways, because this was a negotiation at the end of the day with bureaucrats, and then there was definitely this commercial element to that. Now, is there a way of creating, <laughs> is there a way of, of creating, and the only reason, um, I guess I'm sharing emotion is because I, I think that's the million dollar question, um, but I'm not sure uh, I know what to answer, other than many back then saw this as a really critical fight for recognition. Many back then said, you know, the fact that we don't exist uh, in your studies, in your reports, you know, is negatively affecting us. Like we cannot fight for monies, you know, you know, for job training programs, bilingual education. We can't fight for this if we don't exist as a separate group. And I think that was a time in American history where it was about, you know, you know, recognition politics and how big the categories were. Right? I don't think we're at that moment anymore in which how big the categories were are translate into in fact we might, you know, people are now so anxious and scared about how big potentially minorities in general are and what that means for the values and directions of the country or things like that. But back then, this is the only way you can make these arguments. Um, I think the question would be then, can we have a set of movements focus on combating racism and inequality in a way that isn't just about recognition and stops at recognition, isn't just about creating a new category or not? I think mean, that's a question I don't, I don't know the answer. That's something that I can definitely stop, that's worthy of, of stopping to think about. Um, I think also though we've moved beyond recognition politics. Um, Right now, for example, we're debating whether, um, the Census Bureau is debating whether to insert a Middle Eastern, North African category. Um, and they're, you know, this is not the first time they've thought about this. Actually, around the first times they were debating it, 9-11 happens. And then all sort of the activism towards saying, we need to be a new category because we have, we're discriminated against, we have these systematic inequalities. Um, sort of backtrack in the face of extreme sort of repression, extreme, um, you know, discrimination vis-a-vis -vis this group. Now it's surging again, and now now it's something that's debated right now. But I think, I think you're right. In many ways, fights for equality generally evolve into fights for recognition. And then we go, we stop there. Once you have a category, you think of what are the boundaries of the categories, right? So my one of my senses is that categories are never really defined. Just like, you know, it's so broad. I mean, Mark, Mark is half Latino or Latino, just like I am just like, you know, uh, someone else with an entirely different, you know, reality might be. Um, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, we stopped there. Uh, and I think sort of the argument about uh, what is the social reality that actually brought us here to the table in the first place, uh, you know, could be included. So there are definitely uh, uh, meetings and negotiations that are happening right now about this. And part of this is who should come to those negotiations. Yeah, exactly. And this is not inconsequential. I've sat in on meetings myself about the MENA category in which um, different maps of the world are shown. Yeah. And some renditions of the MENA category would cover places like Sudan within the MENA category. And if you think of a Sudanese um, in the same category as an uh, Israeli, for example, what does that category mean then, right? Like, what does it mean? This is always the gist of it. It's like, where do you draw the boundaries, you know, of who's in and who's out? And how do you manage drawing the boundaries
with a real need. Like often the arguments from these categories spark from a need, whether it's like, we need to be identified so that we can track races act against MENA, you know, versus, you know, well then how do we do it? You know, and the politics of how do you do it are meaningful. And um, in the case of Latinos, it's really gonna, sh you know, you, you think that they might be inconsequential, but over time they become real, they become real. Like uh, we might think of the MENA category now and sort of label it as just sort of something that the state made up. But in 15 years, you know, when there's a MENA category everywhere, when your driver's license says MENA, where organizations for MENA rights come about, um, when companies start trying to make money off of the MENA people, it becomes real. And so, um, I don't know, I don't know how far we go in race politics like this. I don't know. And I'm not sure if how unique the United States is on this. Like, there are fights for recognition across Western Europe right now um, uh, that are meaningful and, you know, that, that have been around for a while that try to resist the fact that the state doesn't see difference because if the state doesn't see difference, then it's denying that there's a racial hierarchy that has existed for a long time across many states and many places. Um, so uh, I, I just know that what's happening is not just about science, and it's not just about what people think and how they feel. It's really about negotiations and what gets lost uh, with those. I think um, what race has meant has, or what racial difference has meant has certainly changed over time. I think the biggest uh, shift uh, in terms of the Bureau was when they shifted to using enumerators and then telling you who you are, who you are to self-identification. And with the shift to self-identification came the sense of, you know, much more messiness on, on their end, their perceived end, right? When a numerator came to your house and, told, and saw you and didn't even ask you and just sort of checked it off, or if you told them something different, you know, they, they would recode you. Um, uh, shift to when the Bureau starts saying, well, if we're gonna let people self-identify, then we're gonna loosen up our idea that race is actually a real scientific difference and just sort of call it a social construct and let it be what it is and let it be understood as it is. I think colloquially, um, ethnicity has been thought of as national difference or sub, some sort of sub-racial difference in which people can be then slotted into the racial difference, the racial uh, taxonomy. So for example, um, Polish ethnicity, right? But then you have some sort of Hispanic pan-ethnicity or something like that. I think colloquially it's understood, but most, uh, you know, uh, for sure, 100% uh, uh, beer guys within the Census Bureau have totally, definitely understood that uh, the idea of what is race and what is ethnicity in people's mind is not clear, it's confused, um, but what is clear is, what is often clear to them is um, that they will fit in one of these labels, um, you know, uh, that they will fit in one of these labels, even if on their everyday basis, they might think of themselves different. So I think there's a sense that identification is different from identity. And that sort of gap that exists there has always been difficult for any researcher. Like, what are you actually saying if you're using the category versus, and that might be different from what people are living and think of themselves as. So that's, that's the, 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 the reality and the, and the gap that's there for sure, and in that identification, that because it's self-identified, is so messy that um, I don't think they even tried to go in and sort of make this distinction. I mean, I think that depends on the other path, other possibilities that were foregone. I mean, I think you would not have the wide array of institutions lobbying on behalf of Latino rights that exist now had that not been in play. The way I think that, and the way people have certainly criticized it is the way it hurts is that within sort of the Latino category, there are huge differences, stark differences, 
And so some people might be free riding, you know, some groups that may not be as disadvantaged are free riding, uh, you know, on the disadvantage of others, or it creates uh, possibilities for a real hierarchy that exists within the category. Some groups just do much better than others, and that hierarchy is occluded because we just think, or uh, we just think about the group as a whole. So it has hurt and benefited. I think overall, though, we wouldn't be talking about Latino politics, you know, if we didn't have it. Um, uh, we'd probably still be, you know, there'd be these disparate groups and. You know, their ability to fight for recognition or have rights would be, you know, dependent on the region of the country where they're at, and that would be different. So, some of the benefits is that it did allow groups to work together nationally, and it did allow sort of small groups. So, if you think of like the emergence of um, um, Latino LGBT organizations, right, um, that might emerge in Minnesota, well, you know, there might not be that many Latino LGBT there, but they could say that they are part of a national community, right? A national community that's important, a national sort of sense of people that are out there that have the same interests as they do. Um, and without having a category that's national, they would not have been able to do that in the first place. 